and um, Smita ran in the last Reba presidential campaign and is a published author. And she so she's written books such as Women in Architecture, Future Healthcare Design, and Architecture for Rapid Change. And I'm just going to try and share a quick video that Smita put together for her Reba presidential campaign. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen now. So there you go. Um, I don't know if everyone heard that, but Smitty, you can probably kick things off now. And if anyone's got any comments, then feel free after us. Um, thanks, thanks, thanks so much. I, I hope uh, people got to listen to it because I couldn't hear anything at all. So <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe you didn't hear anything either. I'm not sure. Uh, but I just thought it'd be a two minute introduction to myself um, rather than saying anything. But um, I don't know, I can't see you. Can you, are you able to raise hands and say if you actually heard anything? Um, no? Okay, so, um, yeah, um, sorry, it's obviously, obviously not worked. <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, I'll have to say it instead of um, um, you watching the video for two minutes. Um, so I'm, uh, okay, yes, so you could read the subtitles. Um, yeah, someone got the gist of it. Okay, that's great. But yeah, so I came here as a, a postgraduate student. I had done my part one and part two in India. And I came here to do a postgraduate in um, environmental design at Cambridge. I won a scholarship and um, I stayed on and I did my part three uh, at South Bank in London and set up practice in one of the most difficult times. Uh, I was 92 when the, um, Again, there was something going on with the European uh, Union. Uh, Britain had uh, just left the currency, the common currency, and um, because it wasn't able to maintain the level at which it needed to be uh, maintained. And then there were several changes announced to do with the uh, profession. So there was uh, the review of the profession and there was the announcement that um, our cook, as it was known, was to be disbanded, uh, which was the Architects Registration Council, and then the RIBA would take over and all sorts of things were going on. 
And then uh, after that, there was a review of the profession by Michael Latham. Um, and then several things came in. And uh, I think there was one by John Warren. So there was all these things happening around the time that I finished my part three. So I thought, oh dear, you know, I have um, left a country and settled here and all this stuff is going around. It, was, it wasn't very easy. It was quite nerve wracking. Um, and then in the middle of that, I was made redundant. So I decided to set up my own practice. So that in short is like basically how I started. And my practice is based around sustainable design and collaboration. Um, again, that those couple of things I'm really passionate about. Um, and um, I started teaching almost as a, uh, as soon as I was practicing. So around the same time as practicing, I was teaching as well, which um, I, I was talking to someone is a form of CPD because you keep in touch with what's happening in the profession. You get to meet students, you get to understand what, what is happening. Um, so I, I was, you know, and, and I, when I started, some of the students were actually older than me. So I was um, quite young when I, when I started. Um, which is a sort of a training in its own way. And then I um, also started writing. Initially, I wrote for free, and then I found that people were willing to pay me. So I've written several books. And then in 2010, I started a charity, and we work uh, around the world in different um, areas, like um, uh, we've worked in the Middle East, uh, in Palestine, we've worked in South America, in Venezuela, and we've done lots of projects in the UK, um, in London particularly, uh, based around the idea of community um, kitchen gardens, uh, the idea of health, food security and healthy living and healthy eating. And um, I also work as a non-exec in the NHS, which has again been an interesting experience through the COVID crisis. So I've been with the NHS since 2013. And I was taken on because of my interest in healthy buildings and they were building a new hospital. So I've been there um, advising them on this new hospital build. And, um, and, and I also chair the workforce committee. So I got involved in um, workforce um, issues uh, in the equality diversity issues, which are actually very complex, much more complex than architecture, I realized that. And um, again, through the COVID uh, period, when many of the staff were working from home, some were shielding how, and uh, some were part-time. So how do, how do we make a hospital work with people working in different places? So that was an interesting learning experience um, as well. So, um, and I've been associated with the RIBA for a, a long time. I have, um, I set up uh, the Ar Architects for Change, which is the Equality Forum. And before that, I used to be chair of Women in Architecture. So those two things came as an interest when I realized that I couldn't see many people that look like me in architecture about 20 years ago. And I wanted to do something. So initially I joined um, uh, the RIBA uh, straight away and uh, I, I started to do something. I joined Women in Architecture, became chair, and then I set up um, Architects for Change, which I chaired for about uh, just over three years. And then someone took over, it's, it's um, still going. But I've been involved with many RIBA committees, the Ethics Committee, Sustainable Development Commission. Um, the, there was a governance review I was involved in, uh, a, a lot of things, international committee, professional practice. Um, so it was almost like a 30 year um, experience with the RIBA. So that's me in short. And I, what I would love to do is get questions from you, things you haven't asked before, or you were sort of, I was saying to John, things you wanted to know about the RIBA, but were afraid to ask, um, or anything about the profession, anything on equality, diversity issues, um, anything really. So I, I just wanted it to be a nice conversation between us. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll start 
by opening the floor up. So if anyone has any questions, if they want to just put it in the chat. Um, but I think maybe I'll, I could start with um, what, why should students join the RIBA and why should we be getting involved with the RIBA, do you think? I think that that's a really, really valid question because, um, um, you know, especially with the overseas students, um, a lot of people think, oh, you know, what's, what's in there for me? I'm going to leave and go away. Why should I join the RIBA? And, well, first of all, it's free. That's one reason. Uh, it's got a fantastic library. Or, uh, unfortunately, you can't visit it. And if you're in Sheffield, it's a long way to um, go to London to visit it. But I think there's an online um, library that you can get hold of. They have an amazing uh, picture uh, collection. Um, and so there, there are different reasons why, as a student, you, sh you should join the RIBA. In my days, it wasn't actually free. I think it was a very small amount, but still it wasn't free. So it's, it's great. And also because the RIBA validates um, the education. And it's, it's great to get involved and have a say in what's happening. So a lot of students got involved in the ACAN, in the climate crisis um, thing, and said, we want the RIBA to do something. And they are doing something. So that's, that's a good, good change. You know, it's positive. Um, some I met some uh, students who were involved in the. Um, there was a project about reuse of materials, and I was um, mentoring them. Uh, and that happened at the RIBA. I think just before. I think the last meeting I went to was just before we had the lockdown. And again, you know, there was such interesting work going on. And actually, I was the one who was inspired from them. So. Here I saw, you know, younger people changing the profession for better. So there are all these reasons to join the RIBA. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a question from Danny Kerr uh, asking, uh, what are the most pressing EDI issues in architecture? Oh, thank you for that. So. Um, some of the things have remained the same. That's what's shocking about architecture. So when I um, joined Women in Architecture, they we had issues uh, with um, women not having childcare and not progressing through the profession. So there were very few women who owned their uh, practices. So you had people like Zaha Hadid and Alison Brooks, um, people like that, very few. Uh, there was Eva Jurikna and um, I can't remember, you know, sole practices which are owned by women. There were several, of course, they were in partnership with their husbands, like um, Patty Hopkins and, and um, uh, people like that. So, but sole women practitioners owning their practice was very few. Um, and I find that it's uh, almost still the same after, um, you know, 20 years, which surprises me. So um, that's one thing. That's the gender issue. The other issue I came across was obviously with, um, you know, diversity. And, you know, time and again, it's been shown that um, the more diverse your practice is, uh, you can actually get so many ideas um, from different perspectives. And it actually makes you more creative and the way it happens is the further you go and um, the more creative you get so let's say you are someone who was born and brought up in in britain uh, if you collaborate with someone from ireland it's not going to be as creative as you collaborating with someone from china or japan or india so the further you go away from your own culture and um, and collaborate with them, uh, you actually become more creative because you're getting all these different ideas through. And also with globalization, you'd be surprised. You think, you know, there are architects working everywhere around the world. So why isn't architecture more diverse? Because surely you want to have um, the cultural perspective uh, from different kinds of people. So that hasn't changed that much. So I think we have about, I think, 7% of, um, in my, during my time when I started, it was 1% or even less. And now it's about 7%, uh, according to some stats, including the students. 
Um, and then women in architecture in my time was, um, um, I think, 8% when I started, and it's now um, 28%. So it's been sort of rising by 1% each year. So um, that's not good enough. You know, in 20 years to have 1% women joining the profession, that's not good enough. So at this rate, we're going to get like um, another 22 years before we get 50-50, which is what we wanted to see many years ago. So that's one issue. And um, the other issue is social mobility, because um, again, you find that um, if you don't have the connections, if you don't have the money, you will struggle um, as a student and you will struggle when you finish. Um, so that that again, um, you know, people don't realize how expensive architecture is to study. So we need to do something about those three issues, you know, your ec economical background, your um, gender and your, you know, ethnicity. We need we need to do all those things. We look at those things to make the profession much more diverse. I think they are doing something, uh, but it needs to move faster. Great, thank you for that. Um, we've got another question from Tasneem, which says, uh, what are the challenges you faced as a brown woman in a field that's dominated by white middle-aged men? Oh yeah, that's, um, <laughs> thank you for that. That's an interesting question because that I face that even in the NHS, I face that everywhere. So it's not particular to architecture. And also as a, as, a, as a person who wasn't born and brought up in this country, I had to get to know the system and that takes a while. So I've, I've um, struggled with it and I have educated myself, I've networked, I've built a good contacts and that's what's helped me. So um, yeah, I, I think, I, think I, do, I did struggle a lot and I still struggle. But, uh, you know, I try and sort of do various things to make, make myself feel more confident uh, by, by learning things, by reading up and all those things. Right. Um, uh, you mentioned briefly there about like working in the NHS as well as um, architecture. Do you, would you say it was any worse in any of the other um, environments or whether it's better in architecture, for example? Sorry, slightly off topic. Um, no, no, it's, it's actually people think the NHS is better. But if you look at architecture, a lot of the architect's profession is um, small practices. So you have about something roughly about 80 percent uh, small practices which might be one person bands and then you have 20 percent which are the big practices uh, middle middle sized and big practices so within the one person ban there isn't excuse me there isn't the you, you can't you don't have the gender pay gap or ethnicity pay gap because it's one person working as themselves uh, or it could be like two three people and the, there are several small practices which are uh, really very good. They don't have any gender pay gaps at all. Whereas in the NHS, um, it, one of the things I've seen is a sort of an average, um, you know, 28% gender pay gap. Um, our trust, uh, the trust I work for is Moorfields Eye Hospital. Um, we have, um, I think it's about uh, I can't remember, 12% of the board, which is the top level, is um, a, has minority ethnic women and our chairman is a woman. But around the country, there are very few people, um, you know, who are from, uh, who are women and chairing the NHS. Um, and also, I think there's just one or two um, people, men, uh, two men who are chairs of NHS trusts, and I think both of them are in uh, in in London. So, um, you know, the NHS to me sounds like it needs to do more work, and uh, we're involved. I'm I'm involved in that because we do staff surveys, and there is a huge amount of bullying and harassment uh, that goes on. But I'm not here to slag the NHS particularly you know, when we're entering the second spike, because I know people work really hard. And then sometimes these workforce issues get 
um, sort of, um, you know, pull down because everybody's in it, you know, it's an emergency, everybody goes and works together. But then these issues remain, you know, they remain in the background, buzzing away, and no one looks at it until there's a problem. So um, this is an ongoing issue with the NHS. But I think, I think architecture could do so much better. You know, we don't have the pressure of trying to save people's lives. Um, you know, uh, there are people who are doing quite well, even in this crisis. And, um, you know, as I said, you know, a lot of them are uh, small practices. So we can make it better. Even the large practices can make themselves better. You know, if you look at the board positions of several large practices, you won't find a single woman, let alone someone uh, with uh, black or brown skin in, in their board in the top level. So I think we can do better. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, Larissa has a question that says, uh, are there any activities or events organised by the REBA that undergraduate students can take part in? Yeah, I mean, they just had one last night, which I attended. Um, that was uh, with all the students, what to do during COVID and how to promote yourself. And that was for part ones, twos and threes. Um, did you know about it? No, probably not. Um, so <laughs> yeah, Larissa is saying no. So I, I think the RIBA is particularly bad at communicating, um, you know, events. They do some really good events. And actually, I didn't even know about it. I learned about it on Twitter. And it seemed they had some spaces, so I joined in. And it was a really fascinating uh, presentation. I've asked them to put it online. Uh, record, it was recorded, so hopefully they'll put it online for people that missed it. Uh, because there were, I think, there were um, four students who spoke and a tutor from Leeds who spoke. And they all had really amazing ideas and tips on what to do um, uh, during, the, during COVID and during a recession. Uh, a question from Tom, how does the REBA plan to bring sustainability and low slash zero carbon better into architectural education? Yeah, so they're, they're looking at the, at the syllabus right now and trying to incorporate um, the, the climate issues into it. But it, it's a huge process because, um, you know, you'll have to look at uh, the syllabus and, and you know, the thing is that uh, the RIBA, people forget, is not just a British uh, thing anymore. It operates in 115 countries. So when you say something like carbon emissions and you go to somewhere in Africa, you know, perhaps it doesn't make so much sense. Something else would make more, more sense there. So it has to be culturally appropriate as well. So I've... Um, um, you know, they are looking into it, and um, I think I was sent a copy. I haven't had a chance to look at it. Uh, so this is on the top of the agenda, climate crisis, um, and um, and how, how it could be um, sort of, not universal, but how it could be applied in different countries where the RIBA is. And the other thing I did was I was part of the Ethics and Sustainable Development Commission, and that over two years looked at uh, how we can um, change the, the code of conduct and uh, make climate change and ethics much more integrated into uh, the code of conduct. And uh, we have done it. I don't know if you've seen the new code of conduct, which um, came into uh, being, I think it was it May 2019. Um, have a look because it does include climate change and environmental issues and ethics into it. Uh, we've got a question from Raluca, which asks, do you have any advice for making contacts as a student who has just moved to the UK? Okay, so my uh, my husband used to joke that, uh, you know, I used to go to the opening of an envelope, you know, um, I, I literally did, and I, I attended anything I could. I used to have lots of energy in those days because I didn't know anybody. So if there is something happening architecturally, please go, because a lot of jobs and things are actually not advertised. You know, you speak to someone and you get um, ideas and, you know, you, you follow on from there. So I'm, 
you know, the other thing you can do is um, join LinkedIn and put yourself out there. Say you're looking for work, um, you know, um, link up with other people, link up with other students, comment on issues. So you on the on the LinkedIn posts, you will see people writing articles or people uh, making uh, posts on things, comment on it. People will see that you're interested in climate change. People will see perhaps you're interested in, uh, I don't know, EDI issues or maybe modern methods of construction or in CLT or some whatever it is. Just try and communicate. Twitter is also a good thing. There's also Instagram which is good because a lot of architects put up uh, the work they're doing. Again, you know, the, the thing is not just joining in, but actually commenting and communicating with people. So um, just make sure your, your presence is felt. We've got a question from Alan, which asks, will this pandemic change the thoughts of architecture design, which means designers should consider an individual's partial independence in space? Sorry, I, I think we'll have to repeat that, please. Uh, will the pandemic change the thoughts of architecture design, which means designers should consider an individual's partial independence on space, or maybe it's in space? Um, it's on the chat thing, if you want to read Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I know, I know, but I'm just trying to understand. Uh, if, if Alan's here, do you want to... Um, Say a bit more. Yes, I, I, can, I can see that. Uh, what does individuals' partial independence in space mean? That's what I'm sort of struggling with. Is is this something to do with uh, space planning, or is Aunt Alan here? Maybe he's left. <laughs> we'll, we'll move on for that one for now and okay. wait till. Alan comes back, I guess. Um, a question here from Zell. Uh, how do you perceive the future of architects as the process of architecture in many countries has been slowing down due to the majority of land having been taken up and developed? Yeah, so I think that's, that's an issue. Um, we are building more and more and not just building on the land that we have, but we're also reclaiming land from the sea which is an ecological disaster in its own way. So um, I, I think architects have a, again, this is to do with ethics and sustainable development, and architects have to um, make sure they are building uh, ethically, uh, using resources wisely, and uh, just creating stuff that needs, that needs to be done. You know, um, I see huge master plans a lot of architects are involved in, and are these necessary? Are they sustainable? Um, are they going to bring local employment? So architects need to ask themselves all these questions about um, their relationship with the external environment before taking on these huge development projects. We've got a question from Jessica, which asks, how would you compare the architecture practice in the UK and the West to that in India. What would your advice be to undergrads who are considering doing their placement in placement year in India or abroad in general? Yeah, I think that that's um, that's a good question. I know that a um, lot of students um, go abroad and get an amazing practice. So last year I was actually teaching a part three student who worked in Japan. And she also worked in Vietnam. And part of her um, um, induction uh, into the practice was that she had to meditate each day for two hours. Uh, it's a very well-known Vietnamese practice. And, um, but that's what she had to do. So she grew up in the UK. And then she went and then she had to adjust to this um, practice. And, and initially, she found it quite stressful, actually. <laughs> Even though she was meditating, she found it very stressful. Um, but she, she liked it in the end. She had a great time and she came back. So I, I know of people who've gone to India and um, had a great time. It's about experiencing different cultures. And again, you bring that diversity of experience back to the UK. 
and you become an expert. You know, there are people. So there's I, I had also had a student who was from South Korea and he ended up working in a practice that was doing some projects in South Korea. So he became an expert um, in, in South Korea, ha had a student who was from Egypt. And he again, because he could speak Arabic and he was from Egypt, he again became this contact point, this go between for the practice um, in the UK, which was doing a project uh, in Egypt. So um, as far as India is concerned, I was a bit shocked when I came to the UK because I just thought it would be really easy for me. And um, uh, at that point, when I came to the UK, we had roughly about 50% of women architects. And I hadn't, um, we didn't have many drop out, people dropping out of architecture. So they were practicing, uh, many women dropping out of architecture. So it was a shock to the system when I came here and found that, um, you know, it was a different uh, way of, um, uh, you know, life here. So people uh, did their architecture and they left and did something else. So that, and then very few women, how few women, there weren't that many women teaching me. I know there weren't that many, as I said, you know, people owning their practice. In India, you did have, um, women who own their practice, really powerful, charismatic women. One of my tutors, she died, um, it was uh, about a um, month and a half. She was my tutor and she was an amazing woman. Um, and, you know, she was such a powerful woman when she spoke. So um, I had those sort of role models. So it was a bit of shock to, to come here and find that things were very different. Uh, we've got another question from Tom, uh, which asks, what is your view on the length of architectural education and alternative qualification routes? Um, let me let me see that um, question is from on the length of architecture. Oh, yes. Yes. So I, I did a Twitter thing on that because a lot of this stuff happens um, because of the length of the education, plus the fact that it's divided, you know, you have um, a year out after part one, and then you have uh, another year out of part two, and then you're doing your part three. So um, I think there is that stress of finding work, which is there, and it lengthens um, your architectural education. Um, my view is that if you look at the states, um, they have, I think they have, is it four plus one or something or four plus two? Um, there, theirs is a shorter one. Different countries have different ways of, um, you know, getting around it. I, I think it's unnecessarily long here. Um, it puts the student into huge debt uh, when they finish. Um, and if, if there was a way to change it, um, I would. I actually ran a Twitter poll um, and I found out that a lot of people were actually supporting, um, you know, the, the removal of, of these, you know, these year outs because, you know, not only did it lengthen the education process, but also made it difficult for some people to find work. And also it left students open to exploitation uh, because a lot of the students were working for free uh, particularly, you know, I think there was an article, was it last week um, in The Guardian about um, people on furlough who have been asked to work, um, all sorts of things going on. So I think I think you need to, um, we need to really think hard on, on this. So they're looking at the moment at the curriculum, but I'm also interested in this aspect. So thank you, Thomas. I will... Um, you know, if I have any uh, means of doing that, I'll keep pressing them on it. Uh, we've got a question from Anna, which says, uh, not long ago, the Reba opened their centre in Liverpool, which has been great for putting the city on the architectural map. Do you think it's important to encourage students slash architects to work outside of London? And do you think the Reba does enough to make their events inclusive for students and architects across the country as a whole? Yes, I, I, I completely agree with you, Anna, because I just feel it's very London centric. And what happens is that if you're in Sheffield, which is a great school of architecture, actually came there to do the, 
validation for Sheffield a few years ago. And it's an amazing place, um, but it doesn't have any links with, with the RIBA in London. And uh, one, one, uh, one of the interesting things, you know, you sort of saw my uh, election video and um, I am using it as a way of introducing myself. And the last, um, I was actually uh, speaking um, at the Architectural Association and uh, this same video was played. And after I finished my talk, I got uh, lots of emails from students um, saying uh, they enjoyed my talk and uh, they would vote for me as a president. So initially I just thought um, maybe they're thinking about the next election. And then it struck me that they didn't even realize that um, there were, had been an election and it had finished. And these were students who were in London, right? So they had no idea that, um, you know, what the RIBA does, have no idea how they engage with students even in London. So let alone in the regions, and um, I feel that there is very little engagement um, with uh, the RIBA with the regions. And I don't know whether it should be like a federation um, with you know regional centers that have this, like with the, with the Liverpool um, or whether, um, because at the moment it's so London centric and so uh, focused maybe on, on certain types of practices that even the smaller practices don't know what is going on. So it, 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 makes, it makes it hard for people to engage with the RIB. And again, that's something I said in my manifesto that we, we really need to think um, how the RIB becomes more relevant to people in the regions. Thank you very much for that. I, if anyone else has any other questions and would like to speak up, um, then feel free, but otherwise, if, if you've got any final points, Samita, that you'd like to wrap things up with, I guess. Oh, um, I, I, was, uh, I was thinking that perhaps, you know, um, I, I wanted to know from, from people who are here, maybe you can uh, speak up and, and, and say, what, what, what do you think RIBA is and why, why do you think it's not relevant to you you know wh why do you feel disconnected is it just the fact that this is based in london or there's a, another kind of disconnect between what the riba is doing and what your aims are of an organization uh, or, or as a student and as a practitioners uh, for the future okay there's danny who wants to say something yeah Hi, thank you. Yes, yeah, so just, just to just get quickly on my background. So I'm a chartered architect. Um, I was also former chair of an RIBA branch uh, in, in Huddersfield, which is where I am right now. Uh, I was chair for five years. Uh, I was also an RIBA role model, uh, which I think is sort of a still a current thing for uh, inclusivity and diversity, etc. And I'm currently at Sheffield University uh, doing my PhD. So I've, uh, I've got quite a lot of experience teaching in universities as well. Uh, so I've seen most sides of it. Um, I, th I think uh, with the RIBA, and I, I've been actively involved, you know, uh, at council at a regional level, and I've been down to London so many different times uh, for, for different purposes. But it, it is a fact. It's remoteness. Um, it, it's, it's like, uh, I mean, uh, two, two decades of saying the same thing, you know, the RIBA is so remote, but there are actually two sides to it, and, and, and uh, this is to do with the universities as well. So, if we're, if we're, if we're thinking about uh, student involvement with the RIBA and their, and their visibility, is that the universities don't really do much. So, once the validation visit is over, the universities don't often think about the RIBA ever again. And uh, as chair at Huddersfield, we've got a big local school of architecture. And I spent five years banging my head against a brick wall, you know, once validation left. And my, my thrust, actually, while I was chair, was actually to divert all our local funds, all the funds that we could get off the RABA, we channeled into student activities. Okay. And, and that, that was the whole thrust. But we had to do it with the students directly, speak to the student group, their society directly, 
because the, the school itself um, weren't a vehicle for any of those transactions. So I think the ROBA and the schools need to be more direct in their conversation. I actually wrote to Alan Jones, our current president, and I directly put, put it to him that we need a new model for validating schools. And it's, so it's not just validating the content of the curriculum, but actually looking at how the school actually interacts with its community. Do they do that outreach that our undergraduates and our, and our master's students want us to do? And, and can they do it through the ROBA and that sort of thing? And I think it needs to be part of that process to get them to pay attention. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I, Danny, I, I so agree with you because this comment that you made about the you know, RIBA coming and doing a validation, leaving, and that's it. That's all the students get to see. And if the students haven't been in that, because I think they do it what, every four years, isn't it? And yeah, if they yeah. haven't been in the, the university at that point, they don't see anything of the RIBA. Yeah. So how do we make the RIBA more relevant to um, students? Um, because you are the future, you know, you are the future colleagues uh, and without you, the RIBA will not exist, right? So, I mean, you've done amazing stuff, you know, by yourself and, and I don't know whether you were supported, did you feel supported from London? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I sort of felt quite often it was the, when I was asked to be involved in uh, Inclusivity, inclusivity and diversity campaigns, then, then I, I sort of called upon as a, somebody to be involved in that. And uh, yes, I def definitely was able to get some money, um, but that, that, that was sort of all it was. But it's certainly worth pointing out that the RIB does have a fantastic branch network. And here in Yorkshire, we've got lots, all, all, all the, uh, the local branches are functioning. Uh, I mentioned on the on the chat actually that there's this, uh, they're not called the Sheffield Society of Architects. It's it's the Sheffield uh, Architects Asso Association, I think, and they're very very active and very involved in the um, the excellent community of architects that there are in in Sheffield, and they do a whole range of you know to get involved in the competitions work and all that sort of stuff. But it's completely open to students as well, and so I think at branch level, I think. You know, that's where students can get involved. And also there's the SUAS, which is the, um, the, the Sheffield School of Architects Society of, of, of Student Architects. Um, they, they also are excellent at connecting to the RIBA. So they, they, they're, because they've got such a good reputation, they know how to connect to the RIBA and, and get speakers in. And so so as, as we're witnessing this evening, you know, the, the, there are these excellent connections. So any student that wants to get involved, the, there's, a, there's the societies there to take the initiative and do it. And there's also Matriarch, uh, the School of Architecture, who are the sort of feminist group uh, for everyone. They, they, and so they, mm, they, they yeah. have a very broad interpretation. So there's lots, lots can be done, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the, the COVID has actually brought, made this more possible because now, you know, I'm speaking to you in the old days, I would probably take a train, come to Sheffield mm. and speak to you, which I have done actually. Um, so I think COVID has um, catalyzed this, um, this digital meeting place. So I, I, I think the RIBA needs to kind of think now, okay, uh, this is already happening. How can we tap into this? Because it's such a shame if, if um, you know, students are being ignored, they just come in. And that's what happened to me in Delhi, actually. I was, um, my school in Delhi was a um, RIBA validated school. So they actually came to Delhi to uh, look at uh, student work and validate. And I was one of the students who presented their work. And that was the first time I'd heard of the RIBA. I had, you know, I was, I had no idea who they were. And then they came and I did my thing. They left. And um, it was only after they left, I sort of realized who they were. But um, again, nothing was happening on the international level. So there are schools in Chile. There are schools in, I don't know, I think there's one in Argentina and Vietnam and all sorts of places. How do we engage all this amazing talent that we have and build an international 
um, architecture practice, you know, an architecture profession, because it is not just British architects anymore. It's an international organization. And we have to think in that big way. We're working globally. How can we, how can we help everybody? And also, you know, it needs to tap into this thing because, you know, like somebody asked, how do I work in India? So, you know, if the, can the RIBA become a platform where you, they connect with some, a practice in India and send students, you know, or they connect with somebody in Australia or somewhere else, you know, and students are actually going out to countries where there might be work um, and, and doing their part ones and threes. So how I think the RIBA needs to um, engage much more and think deeply. And again, you know, I'm, I'm constantly, as a part three um, tutor, I'm constantly thinking, what can the RIBA do? Um, yeah, so thank you for raising that point, Danny. Um, I think, yeah, someone, a couple of questions here. One is, during placement after undergraduate, do you believe it's better to work in a larger practice or a smaller practice? Um, it's, um, I found generally that um, with the smaller practice, you get given much more responsibility and you understand architecture prof profession much more. Um, but, but it's interesting that um, the contracts and things like that, they are going to a lot of larger practices. And the way the contracts are, there's a lot of design and build where the architecture is not the leader anymore, right? So you had the traditional form of contract where the architecture uh, where the architect was the leader leading the project and this often doesn't happen so um if you work in a larger practice you get to know a lot of different things big projects big and that's also good for you uh, and with the smaller practice you get um uh, you know you get given responsibilities uh, but also it makes work life balance very difficult but it can happen in a large practice as well um so I think what you should do is if you worked in a small practice for your post part one, then try and work for a large practice um, in your part two. So you get, you know, you get an understanding of both types of practices and the projects they're doing. I think that that's the way I would, I would go about it. I personally, I worked for uh, several small practices and, um, um, so that's that's how it um, uh, you know it was for me. I didn't think of working for a large practice. I don't know why, but uh, I worked for a medium-sized practice uh, in Cambridge. Um, but yeah, mostly small practices. Um, so the next question is: Would you still recommend architecture as a profession even after mentioning the debt and the exploitation, etc.? Uh, yes, I would certainly recommend it. I think it's a fabulous profession. It's a very creative profession. And even if you end up not doing architecture, uh, you can actually have a, a sense of understanding of space. You can do so many other things within architecture. You can teach, um, you can do research. Um, and, and, and with COVID, I think with this idea of healthy cities, I think architects are really needed. So. I would encourage you um, to keep at it. Um, and uh, what we need to do is make the profession better. So we need to make uh, people be paid better. Uh, we need to make conditions of work better. We need to offer better um, uh, situations for people from, um, you know, from gender, on basis of gender. We need to improve conditions for people from minority ethnic uh, communities and so on and so forth. So, what we need to do is prepare the ground so that people can flourish. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, Mimi, she says, a core aspect to ecologic design is public engagement, are and how the RIB encouraging so participatory practice like post-occupancy evaluation to become commonplace. That's a really good question. Um, so recently, um, there's been a few articles about post-occupancy uh, evaluation. I think it's absolutely important that we do that. And this is actually part of the RIBA Stage 7. 
So, um, you know, in the past, people used to design buildings and just leave it, leave it like that. But now the post occupancy evaluation is become important, not be, just because to see how the space is being used, but also to track things like energy use, uh, stack um, and and um, see how the space can be used better in the future. So there's sort of practical reasons for doing a POE uh, and not just, uh, you know, asking people, do you like this building or not? So um, I think it has a really good uh, practical use of de doing uh, POE. And um, I think we should continue, continue that. Yeah, so I think, what is your view on architectural as again alternative? Did I, did I answer that? I can't remember. Um, so, you know, apprenticeship schemes are really, really good. So, um, you know, the RIBA is encouraging that. So if you can do it, great. I've, I've come across lots of students who've learned a lot, but you do end up working quite a bit. But, you know, you can, you can I think you, you have to make sure that you get enough rest, you get enough time. Um, but this is, this is how it used to be in the old days. You actually jumped in and you did your architecture uh, under the so-called master. But he, so this is a, this is a very age old uh, routine, uh, uh, route to, to do architecture. So um, I, I quite like that. So yeah, I think, I think we've gone through all the questions, haven't we, John? Yeah, I, I think that's all the questions. So unless you've got any final comments or anything, but I think that's, we're about done for the evening, I believe. Okay. Well, it was really fantastic meeting you all um, online. Um, I can't see you all, but I'm sure you're, you're, you're there. And um, really, really lovely. I, I wish I could come to Sheffield. I just love it so much. But, um, um, you know, I can't. <laughs> Not now. But um, hopefully I'll meet you one day. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, thank you very much, Smita, for coming tonight. It was a really good lecture. Um, next week, we've got um, Akil Scave Smith from Resolve Collective coming. Um, and so this lecture is free, but for future lectures, we're hoping that it's it's either two pound per lecture or you can become a SUAS member for five pounds. And you, hopefully we'll get to do some in-person things in the future as well, which would be good, definitely. But yeah, thank you very much again, Smith. It was really good. Thank you, John, for inviting me. That's all right. <laughs> Great. Okay, bye. <laughs> Thank you very much.